I'll be talking about a large global challenge um, and made worse by a lot of wrong-headed thinking and policies. And I'm optimistic because there is an answer to this. This is a very simple remedy, but the solution lies in more grassroots understanding by audiences like this about this problem. And by way of context, when um, uh, Tim asked me to uh, talk at TEDx, he sent me a, uh, an address by Matt Ridley. And Matt Ridley um, put up this chart and um, it showed income per person over the last <coughs> couple of uh, centuries. And you can see there on the bottom, you know, that income doesn't do much. And then bingo, a, you know, a few hundred years ago, it just takes off. And Matt Ridley really posed and, and addressed, well, why is that? What was behind that enormous rate of increase? And he went through this. Now, one of the, there are three reasons for this very large rate of improvement, and these three pillars, and he focused on one of them, the first is productivity, that we've invented lots of things, the steam engine, the internal combustion engine, you know it all, and now it's smartphones, and you heard about the end of money. But he also focused on a second bit, that's trade and exchange, and he concentrated on the idea that trade and exchange allowed the exchange of ideas, but it does another thing as well. And with productivity, these two things interact, and if a farmer can now grow enough food to feed 10 people, well, that frees nine other people up to go along and do something other worthwhile and think and develop ideas and invent things. But in the modern world, this trade, and, and that's what I'll be concentrating on today, um, is backed by another thing, and that's called property rights. So none of this trade and exchange that occurs in the world would happen unless there's uh, ownership of title and enforcement of contracts and a set of rules. Now, I'm not going to talk about property rights today. That's for another TEDx talk at another time. But in passing, we ought to know that that is the solution to all these environmental problems and everything we see today. So if no one owns the water in the river, irrigators will pump it dry. If no one owns the fish, then people are going to cat keep catching until they're all gone. If no one owns the atmosphere, then you'll keep on polluting it. And so the solution on all those large issues is this property rights. So terribly important and um, no more today. I'm going to focus on that uh, central pillar there, trade, and particularly international trade. Now, the international challenge that the planet is going to face, and here's a chart of world population, United Nations projections. And you can see there the enormous increase in population that's occurring right now, and another two billion people are going to come on our planet in the next 40 years. Now, that's two billion, that's an awful lot of people, they're all going to need to be fed and housed. We can't ship them off to Mars or anything yet. And so how is this going to happen? On top of that, and you can see there, all that growth is in the developing countries, there's approximately one billion people today will be living on one dollar a day. And so where these people are, and the resources and the food and the other things they need, is going to be very different from um, the resources they have. And the planet has so many resources, and we need this trade. And what we find is that a one percentage point increase in the ratio of trade to GDP leads to a 2 per 3% increase in income per person. So trade's terribly important, and we know that the arrow goes that way because the causality tests have been done, and trade leads to prosperity. And there's a big difference, I just need to explain about trade, the difference between absolute and comparative advantage. It's obvious if Saudi Arabia has a whole lot of oil under it, it's going to be a huge exporter of oil. But why is 
Japan a large exporter of motor cars? Why aren't they the world's leader and the makers in aircraft? And it's about relative advantage and trade relies on this. And so I make my living as an economist, not because I'm the best economist in the world, actually far from it, there's, I hate to say this in public, but there's a lot, lot better than I. All that matters for me to be able to make a living as an economist is that relatively I'm better at economics than I am at running a restaurant or a mechanic or doing dental work or anything else. It's relatively the best thing I can do. It's a relative concept. And so, because there's differences around the world, there's always relative differences. In this room, me standing here, you'd say, I'm relatively tall. But recently, I was in Singapore, and I went downstairs to a bar, and the Harlem Globetrotters were there, and I was like this. I was relatively short. So the relativity depends on the context and, and its differences. But because there's these relative differences, you get this very powerful thing, it always, always pays to trade. And that's why we have, you've heard today, skydivers, we've had musicians, we've got people here doing AV, we've got experts and all these different occupations and we all trade and exchange. And think about it. Think what your standard of living would be like if you didn't trade and exchange yourself. I mean, I couldn't make my own wristwatch, my own clothes, my own shoes. I couldn't make my own motor car, build my own house. All these things. My standard of living would plummet to that of a Highland tribesman. And so trade and exchange. And the trade between me and that restaurant over the street there is no different from the trade between me and Sydney, Canberra and Sydney, is no different between the trade between Canberra and Tokyo. It's all trade. And you know it intuitively in your stomach that trade is terribly beneficial. And so then you get to the question, well, if trade is so beneficial, why is it that there's so many barriers to trade? There's these huge taxes on trade. Australia is a very big exporter of beef. In fact, in 2004, we were the world's biggest exporter of beef. So why is there a 40% tax on beef from America, New Zealand, Australia, into Korea? 38.5% tax there. And these are huge taxes on food. In India, the taxes are often 100%, one of the poor countries in the world. So why are these large taxes there and what can we do about that? Well, if, if trade is so good, why has it taken the negotiators at the Doha round of trade talks 11 years of negotiation to get absolutely nowhere? They've got nowhere. And this is very costly business. They have about 2,000 journalists going to every one of those jamboree meetings. They all fly at the pointy end of the aeroplane. This is very expensive business and I've got nowhere. Now, maybe it's jobs. Here's a photo of the protests in Seattle, at the so-called Battle of Seattle, where they even couldn't even start a round of trade talks. But it's not jobs, because think about it. You see, if I can buy a Hyundai car for $20,000 instead of a locally made car, etc. well then sure the locally made car job will disappear but I'll have $10,000 in my pocket. What am I going to do with that? First of all I'm going to build a carport for the new car that creates a job but that's $3,000 and I've got another seven then I might go to an investment advisor to work out what, how am I going to invest my other money and so on and through that process I create the other, other jobs. Is it the income inequality? You know, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Well, you can plot all the countries in the world there on those little dots, and you find there that as the income of the country goes up, the income of the poor goes up as well. What about other things? Is it something else? Is it education, you know, or the, the, the bit worse environmental outcomes? You can plot them all, they've all been done. As we get richer, you get better social outcomes, better environmental outcomes. Now then I put up 
a quick quiz when I was addressing 19 journalists. The real answer lies in this misunderstanding. And think about what you would do. I put up this um, question. I said, exports, are they good or bad? And I asked the question, are imports good or bad? Now think about what would you do? I'm not going to get you to stand up and count hands or something because it'll take too long. But the journos all decided that 19 of these journos, all of them, said exports are good, zero bad. But what about imports? What's your view on imports? Are they good or bad? Well, these business journalists, 19 said bad <laughs> and zero said good. And these are supposed to be educated people and they write about business. All of that should have been there. See, the whole purpose of an economy is to consume. If I can buy cheaper, then that's the whole thing. The only purpose of exports is to be able to pay for the imports, which is improves your standard of living. So this is the major misunderstanding that's there. And it's fueled by the WTO because that process of negotiation treats exports good and imports bad. We go to Korea and we say, you take your 40% tax off beef and we could sell you some more beef. And they say, no, you take your tariff off on cars and we'll send you some more cars. And we say, no, no, no. So this is the problem. And exports good, imports bad, wrong-headed thinking, wrong sort of process. The negotiations will never get anywhere. Now, there is an answer to all this. And here's this magic word, transparency. And I know this might be a bit hard. And what is transparency? Transparency means looking at these issues and diagnosing what's really happening. It means the evaluation of the benefits and costs of making that choice. Should you have a 40% tariff on beef or should you not? Then the first thing you need is open information. And most people, though, think that is it. Freedom of Information Acts, yeah, we've got transparency. But it's much more than that. It's no good enough just to know that we've got 40% um, tariff on Korean beef imports. What needs to know, the Koreans need to know, that what are the benefits and costs of that? What, is it in their interests to get rid of that tariff or to keep it on? But then they need something else because... We've already said that we specialise, we have skydivers and musicians and technicians and everything else, so everyone here can't go along and do the, or everyone in Korea can't do their own bit of analysis, we leave it up to the experts. So this all has to be analysed in a very credible and believable way that people can trust and accept. So it has to be in independent, impartial, contestable, so people can see and believe in that answer, a bit like a law court. Now, a lot of people in the world do those three elements there. The World Bank, for example, does very good work. They do national interest tests. They do credible, you can believe their findings are terrific. But there's one other ingredient that's missing, and pretty much everyone misses this last one, and that's the accountability of the decisions. All that work has to be somewhere a government a part of the government decision-making process, a bit like making good science as an input into climate change policies. And that's the bit that's missing pretty much everywhere in the world. Now, this transparency works. And why does it work? I'll summarise this, because it identifies the national interest, it informs and educates the public, it exposes narrow vested interests, which often are the blockers, and they just parody these mis myths about trade. It makes the policy more predictable so people know where they stand and uncertainty is a killer for investment. And the best example, if you walk that direction 956 paces, you'll come to the Australian Productivity Commission. And it's the best example in the world. All others, and we've assessed them all, pretty much fail on one or more others other criteria. And does it work? Well, yes. Since 19 in the early 70s, when the Productivity Commission was set up, they were hammering away at this, evaluating our own tariff policy, and Australia is one of the few countries in the world which has unilaterally lowered barriers to protection. 
And you can see there that chart is coming down, 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 down. Over time, it's worked. Now, the WTO, the World Trade Organization themselves, they had an expert panel to assess what should they do to get these trade barriers down. And the expert panel, head, headed up by a former Director General of the World Trade Organization, the Olivia Long Report in 1987, he came out and he said, well, yes, we do need to um, have this public scrutiny of protection. We do need to have more transparency. And it has, has to be done within each domestic economy. Because the gainers from the removal of the 40% tariff on beef in Korea are the Koreans. The gainers on removing barriers to trade in India are the Indians. 90% of the gains go to them. And so here in Australia, because of this education process that went on, protection has come down. And funnily enough, Australia is one of the few countries in the world that's had 21 years without going into recession. We've done famously well out of that one step and that one move of transparency. So let me wrap all this up. What's the bottom line in this? First of all, trade is essential to feed and house this growing world. The removal to these barriers to trade, and there's some big barriers out there still, offers very big gains. The answer is simple, so that's what gives me cause for optimism. It's a very simple remedy to fix. Where it's tried, it's certainly worked. And in a nutshell, decisions cannot be made in the national interest if the national interest is not measured. If you don't know what's in the national interest, how can you make an informed decision? But this has to be done in a particular way, in a way that people trust, and that is really what transparency is about. And finally, what can you do? Well, insist that policies around the world are subject to world's best practice transparency processes. So you know what to do. Get out the smartphone and the iPad and get onto Twitter and Facebook. 300 million people depend on it. Thank you.